Hello and welcome to the Mayor Capital quarterly three questions and answers session uh, with us here today. Um, my name is Lee Overall Gibbons. I'm the head of sales and client relations here at Mayor Capital. Um, I'm joined by two guests uh, with me. Uh, so we have Aziz Alnain, who is the MD and portfolio manager of the Mayor Responsible Global Equity Fund, and also Aubrey Brocklebank, who is a partner, deputy portfolio manager, and head of investment research at Mayor Capital. So welcome, gents. Thank you. Um, welcome to you who are joining us here today. Uh, thank you so much for the questions that you have posed. And um, so we're here now for about 25 minutes going through the live Q&A. So if you have any burning questions, please do pose them and we'll do our very best to get them answered for you. Uh, but we will crack on with the questions for the next 25 minutes. And then I will hand over to Aubrey, who will give an update on our investment team recruitment. Um, so without any further ado, let's kick off with the questions and we have some great ones so thank you again for them so the first one uh that i have gents we've got some really fantastic themes happening at the moment so lots of questions around these um one of the questions is surrounding ai um so do you believe ai disruption could be a game changer for all sectors Hence, technology could continue to outperform all sectors for the long run. I mean, obviously, that is the um, trillion dollar question. I guess. Uh, you've had some thoughts about it because you and I were chatting about it before. Well, yeah, so uh, that's why I brought uh, this prop in here. Uh, actually, it's a really good book recommendation, Engines That Move Markets by Alistair Nair. And he goes through the history of technological uh, innovation and disruption. And he goes from railways, canals, steamboats, telephones, telegrams, electricity, gas, trains, planes, automobiles, wireless radio, concert halls, televisions, garbage machines, mainframes, PCs, personal PCs, that is, and the internet. And um, guess what? It all follows the same pattern. You know, every single one of those, you have this new tech that comes in, disrupts uh, everything, and everyone goes, wow, this is amazing. Capital floods into it. And you can quickly see who the losers are. You can quickly see how railways are going to disrupt canals. You can quickly see how telephone disrupts telegrams. But you don't necessarily see who's going to be the winner. You know that the technology is going to win, but you don't know who the individual winners are. And the path to getting there is almost always very, very painful because capital goes in this you know, uh, you get frauds, you get, um, you know, uh, companies that make huge amounts of money for short periods of time and then their earnings normalize uh, because this is just what happens with uh, capitalism. You know, if you have a new technology, a new opportunity, you know, everyone wants a part of it. And as uh, they seek to do that, you know, they, uh, margins get damaged uh, for those companies. Uh, but eventually, you, know, you will have one or two winners. Sometimes you can spot them in advance. Most often you can't. So what, what do I think is going to happen here? Well, I think I don't want to bet against you know, all of this history. I, I don't want to say, okay, NVIDIA is going to be the winner. Maybe, maybe it is, but you know, it's a very, very difficult call to make. You look at all of history and you go, making a call that NVIDIA is going to uh, do this would be very difficult. Um, the tech itself, is it going to uh, change the world? Yes, but that doesn't mean to say that the providers are going to capture all the benefit. You know, the beneficiaries have to as well, the industrial companies, uh, you know, the law firms, anyone who's using this tech has to benefit from it, otherwise there's no point. Uh, and that's, uh, again, something you see here, you know, how the beneficiaries uh, you know, profit from this. So will tech continue for the foreseeable, for, will it be stronger for longer? You know, yeah, maybe this time it's different, but I suspect we will have a reversion. 
Uh, we will see a shakeout because it, it always happens. We will find out that a lot of these technologies are probably actually not that valuable. Um, you know, because we talk about AI as this sort of homogenous thing, but it's not. There are a huge number of different AIs, different companies, different LLMs, different use cases. Some of them will be fantastic, some of them won't. Um, but what do we do? Well, you know, we're not going to speculate. But that being said, it doesn't mean to say that we're not benefiting. One of our holdings, SAP, has been doing amazingly well recently. And you know, they are a sort of very solid industrial software company that um, you know, has been around for ages. But uh, they've been benefiting from it. Uh, you know, Cap Gemini, uh, we own that. There is no way we can see a major uh, technological shift without the systems integrators uh, and the consultants who actually implement this and go in and help you realize this transition. There is no way that that can happen without people like Capgemini benefiting. Um, uh, so yeah, um, could it go on? Yes, and long term, absolutely. But over the short term, and when I say short term, I mean, in this case, five years, uh, which, you know, no, I think you know, we could see uh, a lot of a lot of turbulence. Well, I think the other thing to add is there is a big difference between trying to understand and essentially make a forecast about what's going to happen to specific stocks versus, which is, which is not what we like to do, mm -hmm. versus trying to understand the impact fundamentally on individual businesses, industries, and so forth. And like you said, sometimes it's easier to see who's going to get hurt than it is to see who's going to get uh, the benefit from something. And, and obviously, uh, I think what you said really sums it up very well. Uh, I think within our investment horizon of five years plus, it is hard to see how, and by the way, AI did not start with ChatGPT, right? It's just, or large language models for that matter. These are all applications. They happen to be very consumer based and that's why people are very excited about it and why individual retail investors are excited about it and so forth. But it's been happening for a very long time and it's been getting better and better. And the ap applications that do exist are actually the ones you don't see. Uh, so arguably the implications of things like chat GPT uh, in and of itself, not just large language models, but kind of chatting to a computer and hoping it does something for you. That actually has, there's, there's been no commercial business model for that. So that, that might be completely worthless for, for all we know. Uh, the part where we do know exists has, has been ongoing and will continue to go. And obviously it's, it's accelerating because you've got all these other applications and technology is getting better at it and for the hardware and the software. And, and I think we're going to see very important benefits to it in terms of improved productivity across the economy. Based on history, this will take a very long time People, I can't remember, I think it's Bill Gates who said that, but people overestimate what can happen in the short term and underestimate what can happen in the long term. So by all means, I do think it's going to have an important impact and it will touch every aspect of, of the economy in our lives, but it probably won't be as easy as uh, chat GPT. And then the other thing I think that we learn from historical, whether in this books or just studying history in general, is... There's a big lag between when a technology comes and when it finds actual commercial applications. We saw this most famously with the internet. It completely revolutionary, revolutionized our lives and it's impossible to imagine a world without internet today. But a lot of the applications happened much, much later than 2000 mm -hmm. and certainly commercially the benefit. I mean, for years people talked about kind of the productivity gap from, from investment in the internet. And the odds are the same thing will happen today. A lot of money will go into it. It's one of those things, it's, bubbles are really funny because they're, they're one of those things that are really good for society. Mm. Because a lot of money goes into something that's very beneficial, but, but very horrible for capitalists. <laughs> yeah. Really bad for capitalists. And well, I think the same I thing. Know. You know, you know, uh, someone said that uh, bubbles are a great way to transfer uh, capital from uh, the uh, insane into the same. Yeah. Well, and and, and, and transfer money from 
the impatient to the patient. Yeah, so that's, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I think it's going to be very important. I think it's going to touch everything that we do. It already is. Uh, I think this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and I and I don't think it's 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 clear to me where you'd have a clear bet on it to make money in the short term. Uh, I think there's going to be incremental gains in things like you said, Capgemini and SAP, and even the industrial businesses that we own. Uh, but but I think it's a longer term benefit. I don't think it's a short term. And and if it is as disruptive as as we think it's going to be, in, and what let's say called the hype, then it's not going to be too late to to benefit from it over the next five, ten, twenty, thirty years. It seems to me like it's a very much a long term game with that. And quite rightfully said on the the marathon and not the sprint. I can remember when. Um, mobile phones were created and what we used to do before that. So you think yeah. about how far we've come. Um, again, on the bigger themes, um, what are your thoughts on the current US elections and the potential wider implications for markets? Well, I think someone is going to win. I'm not 100% certain of that, but I think someone's going to win. I think it's going to be either a man or a woman. It's going to be either a man or a woman. That's true. Actually, this is something that you can yeah. you can really say this time around. Uh, that's the extent that I think of my certainty about it. I I don't think it's going to matter for the market. To be completely honest, I think there is a scenario where a certain winner does something really bad and and is bad for humanity and but. I think that's a low probability event, and and I think if it does happen, I don't think markets are going to be our main worry. Do you think that there would be any implications on things like tariffs if you know certain political? Nobody knows. I mean, the problem is even with these things, people, certain individuals say things and just don't know what they're going to do eventually, you don't know what actually is going to be doable. And there's a lot of uh, saber rattling that happens. And we've also seen a lot of tariffs already. Yeah. And we saw a lot under Trump's first presidency. And we thought that we might see a lessening of that under Biden, but didn't really, in, fact, yeah. you know, in many ways, or more. Uh, so, you know, who knows? And a lot of these things, to be honest, you know, we're trying, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but the truth is they're just the, the range of things that are going to impact this. Are so it's, with a lot of these things, there's always the, the idea that holding everything else equal, this will happen. But nothing is held equal in, in, in this situation. And what happens in Congress, what happens in, I mean, this year we've saw, I think we've already seen by the close of the U.S. election and the Japanese election, I think 60% of, uh, and yes, nobody's talking about the Japanese election. Uh, more than, I think, 60% of the world's population has voted for a new leadership. And some of them have been surprising and shocking, like we've seen with France, for example. Actually, the Japanese one was also unexpected. Uh, but nothing is, is going to be in a vacuum. There's a lot that's going on economically, geopolitically, all of these things. And, and I think it's impossible to predict an impact over the short term or, or the medium term. I think it's something where you have to continue to monitor the situation, deal with things as they happen. Uh, I think, it, especially as it impacts our portfolio, I, I'm not, I don't think it's going to have a big impact that is material or uh, persistent, to be completely honest. So on, on the portfolio then, and thinking about how you manage the portfolio, Protection on the downside is a key feature of the fund. Can you share with us how you think about risk and how you apply it to the investment process? Well, I think the one thing that we've always talked about, and I don't know, uh, I'm going to try and articulate it in, in as short a time possible. Uh, we view risk as something that needs to be understood and managed every single step of the way. Uh, this idea that you're going to have someone who comes in and is in charge of risk, we, we don't believe works. And, and the way we approach it is very early on, we've talked about this before, when we're basically looking at a new idea, uh, the first thing you want to do is kill the idea quickly. And in that, 
we're always looking at things like accounting health, related party transactions, and, and really quick ways of, of destroying the idea, essentially, uh, in terms of unacceptable risks. You know, very few ideas actually make it through this stuff. I don't know, you, you might know the, the, the percentage. Uh, but then we do have a dedicated risk checklist that is part of our deep dive. And then every step of the way within every checklist, we're scoring questions and managing the business risk by looking at things like the quality of, 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 uh, of, of the business, the quality of management, the behavior of management, uh, the alignment of management. All of these are risks that we're managing. We're also managing risks on the environmental and social side. So all of these are risks that are managed throughout the multi-checklist scoring system that we that we use. You're thinking about the cyclicality of the business as well. Yeah. You know, which obviously, you know, and the sort of earnings itself, what are the earnings risks? How much comes from, you know, from you know, let's say the sit calls to the stable. Um, yeah, as you say, just every step of the process. And all of these feed into the final uh, kind of decision of whether to own something or not. And then on top of that, once we're kind of doing portfolio construction, we're also looking at the, the risk in several other ways. So one, when we go through the valuation uh, process, we're looking at assumptions and we're thinking about downside risk assumptions that go into the valuation process. We're running, as you know, a prob we run a probabilistic valuation uh, of, of the things that we look at. So we're looking at a range of outcomes from evaluation. We then insist on having a margin of safety, so the price risk is managed through through that as well. And then finally, when we put a portfolio together, we're looking at diversification between individual names, between different industries, between different geographies, and managing kind of the concentration risk that way as well. So I think. Well, and also don't forget, you know, whilst we don't necessarily shy away from uh, stocks just because they're a bit riskier. We then might manage that in the portfolio level by only having a small position. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a stock that you know does have higher risk but a lot of upside, you might only have a two percent position in it. Sure. Whereas you know a much more stable company like Unilever, you then have a much larger position. Yeah, I think there's no avoiding risk. Uh, our job isn't to avoid risk. If you avoid risk completely, you make the risk free rate, right? <laughs> uh, our job is to manage the risk. We want to minimize the risk but we want to manage it. And we also don't want to take, I, I think when it comes to risk avoidance, which is, it, it should really be limited to either risks that you don't understand, which you definitely want to, want to avoid. Uh, and then the other thing is you don't want to take aggregate risks beyond a certain level. So you don't want to take, for example, go take all your money and put it in, I don't know, one stock in one geography. Because if it blows up, then the aggregate risk is too high. But at an individual level, you manage the risk, you incorporate it into your understanding of the business, you incorporate it into your valuation, and you incorporate it into your portfolio construction to make sure that risk is managed properly. And that overall, you are proceeding, but with caution, but you are taking sensible risks, and that you are getting paid for taking these sensible risks. So don't take a risk with no upside, basically, like you said. It, it needs to be commensurate with, with the risk that you're taking. That's really useful. Thank you, Aziz, for that. Um, I can see in the audience we do have a hands up. Um, and so I would um, encourage that person, if you pop your question in the Q&A section, um, that should then come through to us. Um, likewise, if we don't have a chance to answer all the questions in this live session, then we will respond to you separately afterwards as well. Um, so I hope that's OK and we get your question. Uh, so coming back to the other questions that have come in, um, looking at the UK government budget, which is due at the end of this month, next week, mindful uh, that exposure in the fund is approximately at the 20% mark. Uh, what do you envisage this could look like for UK business and the current exposure that you have within the fund? Well, I want to hand it over to you in a second to talk about the opportunities that come out of the budget. But I think on the risk side of things, uh, while yes, our allocation looks like it's close to or around 20% of the portfolio, that's by listing. That's not how we think about risk uh, from a geographic point of view. So we look at it in turn by looking at the underlying revenue sources of these companies. So for example, 
there are two businesses in there that are almost fully uh, U.S. businesses, uh, which are Ashstead and uh, Foreign Print. Even though they're listed in the U.K., you're actually taking U.S. risk from a business point of view. So they, these are U.S. businesses that just happen to be listed in the U.K. We own... Uh, UK businesses like Unilever, where the UK is a tiny single percentage of, of revenue, so that's not really a UK risk. Uh, and, and, and so once you take these out, you're looking at, I would say, mid, mid-ish single-digit exposure to the UK from an economic point of view, uh, uh, coming mostly from owning Vistry and, and, and owning Howden's. Uh, and at that level, we were very comfortable about it. I mean, back to what I was saying earlier, I think we were, we think we're getting paid for taking this risk. And I think there are things which, or we can talk about it in a second, where we are actually seeing a lot of opportunities to come out of this budget and the new government uh, that were not present before. And, and, and while many of them we don't know the details of, because until the budget is out, well, it sounds like even the government don't know, but I tell the budget is out, we don't know the details, but I think it, on average, it, it presents an opportunity for us. Uh, yeah, so I mean, one opportunity could be for Vistry uh, because they produce affordable for housing and that's uh, been a key priority for the government. Uh, so they could do something to support that. We believe that they could uh, also support some form of help to buy. Um, but one of the other uh, opportunities that I'm actually really excited about, uh, and I know that a lot of you know, our colleagues in the investment management world won't be so keen, especially those managing inheritance tax portfolios, but is potentially the removal of business property relief. So if you own certain aim-listed stocks that fall under certain uh, and categories... And aim is the secondary market. In the yes. Case. Technically, they're unlisted. And that means they classify for business property relief. So it means you only have to hold them for two years for your children to be able to inherit them tax-free. So there are a huge number of aim portfolios in this country for this basis. Uh, and there are several stocks we're looking at where over 10% of the shareholders are holding it for business property relief. Now, if that gets taken away, there is a very, very good chance that all these uh, holders will sell, or at least sell a huge uh, percentage of the, uh, those holdings, um, which to us just presents an amazing opportunity. Anytime you get uh, an opportunity where the stock price you know, is massively oversold, at to do with nothing to do with the fundamentals, that's always going to be a buying opportunity. And whenever we find opportunities like this that are about to happen, that's when we do a lot of work beforehand to go, right, how do we best uh, capitalize on that? Uh, and we did that with Brexit and the home builders. Yeah. We've done that uh, with uh, you know, elections in the past, you know, where we thought. And uh, this is just another opportunity where we see yeah, just a great possibility of making very, very significant uh, outperformance. Um, so we've just got one quick question that's come in, and this will have to be the final question. So what's your process for deciding when to exit a position, especially when it's performing well? Is this a question that just came in? It's just came in, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think there are three reasons to uh, exit a position. The, the first one is if the thesis is broken. And that can happen early on because we made a mistake. Or it can happen later on because the fundamentals of the business have changed over time. So uh, either you thought something about the fundamentals that isn't true, or you were right, and five, 10 years later, businesses like everything else in life deteriorate, change, get into a business, they spin off something, buy something else, it happens. But I think this is the probably the best reason to sell. Often, unfortunately, it happens that you sell and, and, and you lose money when you do it because, uh, especially if it happened early on, if you made the mistake, but it's worse than holding it, hoping for some magic to happen. Uh, you don't have to make money back in the same way that you lost it. Uh, but basically, a fundamental change in the business is, is, is the first reason. Uh, the second reason is valuation. For every price point, the risk reward changes. At some point, something, and you're always comparing it, uh, at least uh, we are always comparing it to everything that we own 
everything in our bench that we're looking at. And worst case scenario, comparing it to cash, where we're saying we don't like anything else, but cash is better in the short term than, than owning these things when it's an extreme valuation. And that might cause us to trim a position or fully exit a position. So, and that, that happens all the time. I mean, it would be great if we bought something and it never got too expensive and we continue to own it forever. It's happened. There are things obviously that we've owned for a very long time. Uh, but sometimes the market just gets ahead of itself and things get too expensive. And, and sometimes it comes down and we buy it again. That's also happened many times over the years. So that's the second reason, which is valuation. The third reason is, and this happens if in period where we have been fully invested, where there is something that we own that we like fundamentally, that is fairly valued, so not necessarily overvalued to trigger a sale, but we find this other opportunity that is just a lot more attractive, either fundamentally or kind of in terms of upside, downside uh, presented to us. And so we would sell because we sell something good to buy something great. Uh, and if we weren't fully invested, maybe we would have held on to it. But in the end, you're always doing these comparisons between what you own and what you could own, both today and, and in the future. And that determines whether you sell something or not. I don't know if you have anything. I'd say that, uh, the thing that's far harder than selling when things are going up is actually selling when things are going down. Yeah. Because something bad happens, the price falls, how much it falls. And you go, okay, this bad thing has happened, therefore the price should fall, but the price has fallen. Well, now what do you do? Yeah, and that is very easy to get lulled into sort of bear traps where, uh, where you go, no, no, it, it's now good value. And then bad things keep continuing to happen. And yeah, that's a very, very dangerous place to be in. Yeah, and so with that, when we do have things like that, we tend to try and say to ourselves that we've either got to buy more or we've uh, got to sell out. Yeah. And you have to buy 1% more. I mean, yeah. The rule is if, if something falls by 20% or more, we do a full review and we have only one of two options. Hold is not, is not an option. You either add 1% to the portfolio or you'll fully exit. It's either actually attractive and you're willing to risk new money. Or if you're not willing to risk new money, then you're just sucking your thumb and you should fully exit. And that's relative performance. So yeah. you know, if the whole market falls 20%, we're not yeah, reviewing yeah. the whole portfolio. Yeah. Jen, thank you very much for the questions and answers there. Um, appreciate that. Aubrey, I would like to now hand over to you because we're at that time. We've actually rattled through those uh, yeah. for you to give uh, some information on the investment team recruitment. Yes, so I'm just going to keep this very brief. And it's, uh, you know, so I think so far we've got almost 400 candidates and the job uh, has been live for not that long. Uh, there are some you know, amazing candidates in there. And I'm, you know, maybe, uh, you know, some of you are you know, online watching now or watching the replay. Um, I'll be very impressed uh, if you are. Uh, but if you are, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a tip here because at some point... Uh, if you get through the interview uh, with HR, uh, you will then uh, be asked to do a case study, and I'll be reading these case studies, and there will probably be an awful lot of them. Uh, hence, uh, you know, I thought if I give you some tips, it might make uh, the reading a little bit easier for me. Uh, so so uh, first thing is clarity. This is really important. I'm gonna, as I've said, I'm going to be reading a lot. Write clearly and concisely. Scrap all adjectives, adverbs, you don't need them. Just focus on really good writing. Uh, because otherwise, if you make it hard for me to read, it's then going to be hard for me to see your brilliance. Second, research and analysis. You know, the clue's in the job. You know, we're research analysts. You do your research and then you analyze. Now, in the past, I've seen a lot of case studies where there's been excellent research but very little analysis. You know, people will say, okay, it's got a great return on capital, but okay, but so what? What, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to the company? Is it going to redeploy it at higher uh, rates? Or is it going to uh, deploy that cash uh, you know, to shareholders? So tell me what's going to happen. So focus on what matters. Does it, you make a point, but does it affect growth, margin, asset terms, or multiple? 
If it doesn't affect one of those four things, it's probably not actually going to be that important. You know, don't tell me the name of the CEO's dog. You know, focus on things that matter. Um, also, make just uh, you know any assumptions you make really please justify them. Uh, so look at competitors, look at comparables, uh, be balanced. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you want to provide a model. That is an opportunity for you to show off. I don't know why anyone would not want to take an opportunity to show off during a job interview. But most of all, please, please try and be interesting. Again, I'm reading a huge number, but you're going to have to make it stand out. You're going to have to be creative. Make me see that you are differentiated, but yet differentiated without being too contrarian, you know, or contrary. I don't want you to say, oh, no, this is a rubbish business and then not justify it. You know, but you have to be different. And yeah, that's it. And look, good luck. Um, it's, I know it's a really tough process. I'm really glad I don't have to go through this process. But, um, uh, but yeah, good luck. And I look forward to uh, reading and meeting some of you. I, I will also add that in order to let me know that you've seen this. Do you have something or should I pick something? You, you pick something. All right. Try to uh, create, to add, I don't know, hall of shame <laughs> somewhere into the case study. If you can weave it in, and then I will know that you've, uh, you've, you've, you've watched this and... And you get brownie points for get brownie uh, doing good points. research. Yeah. Well, they've got quite a task, haven't they? I wish you all good luck for those who are applying for the roles. Actually, there is one more tip, but please, please. I don't know how many pages I'm going to give you, uh, but it'll probably be between two and four. Whatever number I give, do not go over and above that. Uh, so many times you see a candidate, you know, provide six, eight, ten pages. And that's, you know, one, I have to read it. Uh, well, actually, I don't, because it's proven that you can't follow instructions. <laughs> So, you know, if I say two pages, please, please stick to two pages. Thank you. Well, some great pointers there and good luck to all of those who apply for the roles. Um, so thank you very much, gents, for your contribution today. Always enlightening. Um, great questions from our audience. Thank you for joining us again. And thank you for your continued support. Uh, we greatly appreciate that at Mayor Capital. Um, and with that, I will draw this session to a close and wish you all a good day. Thank you.